Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, the Bald Explorer, and I'm exploring The Tales of Old Sussex by Philip Mercer, published in 1834. A book with lots of interesting yarns. Who knows whether they're true or not, but they're fascinating to explore. And this one is the story of the secret room, or the ghostly lock, as Philip Mercer calls it. It seems that there was a gentleman by the name of Horace Satchel Smith who moved to Slindon near Horsham in West Sussex. He was a, a pompous gentleman, an arrogant person. He seemed to cause hatred wherever he went. Nobody liked him. He treated the people with complete contempt and disrespect. He moved into a large timber-framed house and took on a number of servants who all withered as soon as he looked at them. He was so horrible, he would bang his fist on shop counters, demanding immediate assistance. He was an art collector, dealing particularly in paintings and some vases and figurines. On one occasion, returning from Horsham, the nearest county town, he came across some women in the road as his coach hurtled along. He'd just purchased a, a number of artworks and he was insistent on getting them home. Well, these women were laughing and joking and having fun. And in his impatience, Satchel Smith bellowed at them to get out of the way. They looked at him as he was coming towards them and refused. There was plenty enough room for both. No, he said to his coachman, run them down. They're in my way. The coachman dutifully obeyed. And the women at the very last moment jumped off the road. One of them, who was pregnant, landed in a ditch heavily. But Satchel Smith gave them not even the flicker of an eye and hurried home with his beloved art. Because his reputation as the most hated man in the village began to grow, he started to become more concerned for his valuable art collection. So engaged a carpenter with the instructions to create a secret room in his house, which he did. Then he engaged the local locksmith to come and place in a secret door with a lock that was the securest of locks in all of Christendom. The locksmith was reluctant to do this for him, but he paid him handsomely and bellowed loudly until the locksmith succumbed. And when the locksmith had finished his work, he handed over the key to Satchel Smith and said, Sir, I have fitted you a lock, but this is the only key. Therefore, keep it close to you at all times and let no one take it. For without that key, you will never be able to get into this room. Good, said Satchel Smith, paid off the locksmith and told him to leave. The secret room and the door leading to it had been positioned behind a sliding bookcase. He placed inside this room all his valuables and satisfied that they would all fit in and that he could look at them each night before he retired, he would lock the door with the key which he kept on a chain around his neck and then slide the bookcase shut, retiring to his bedroom and placing the key under his pillow. Nobody would get the key and nobody would have access to his valuable artworks. One morning, impatient as ever, trying to have breakfast, trying to get dressed, trying to get out into town so that he could look at some more artworks, he suddenly realised that he couldn't find his money purse. He normally locked it in his bureau, but he opened his bureau and he searched the drawers and it wasn't there. This was very frustrating, and he was certain that one member of the staff had stolen it. He lined them all up, and he questioned them, interrogating them. Where were you on the night of? What have you done with it? Have you got it? Where is it? Which one of you have it? I will have you all flogged. And this went on for some time, and then suddenly he had a flash of memory, and he remembered the night before he had gone into his secret room and he had placed the money purse down as he was admiring one of his pieces of art. He turned on his heel and he marched back up to the room, sliding the bookcase across, 
thrusting open the door and scanning around to the table where he had left his money purse. And there, sure enough, it was. He opened it, checking the contents, and all his money was secure, as indeed was the rest of the artwork. He went out and closed the door and went to turn the key. Only the key wasn't in his hand, it was still around his neck. And then he realised he had opened the door without unlocking it first. He stood there for some moments, wondering how that was possible, for he knew he had locked it the night before, or at least he thought he knew he had locked it the night before. This was unusual, but he cursed himself for being so absent-minded. He took out the key, however, and he locked the door, and double-checked that this time he had locked the door. He put the key back into his jacket, then he slid the bookcase back, and everything was secure. And he went on with his day's work. And at the end of the day, after his work, he returned to the secret room, first sliding the bookcase to one side, taking out the key, unlocking the door, and going in to enjoy his artworks, and perhaps having a, a small glass of port as he did so. And then, before he went to bed, he purposefully took out the key. He locked the door. He checked the door was locked. He wasn't going to be absent-minded anymore. He slid back the bookcase and he returned to bed in the normal way, ensuring that the key was under his pillow. The following morning, as he came down for breakfast, he paused beside the bookcase. And really, it was on a whim that he slid the bookcase to one side and without taking out the key, he turned the handle of the secret door and it opened. He was enraged. Quickly he went into the room and he checked the contents, but nothing had been stolen. It was all as before. And yet somehow the door had been unlocked. Convinced that a member of staff was doing this, he again lined them all up. He chastised them. He bellowed at them. He asked them to tell him which one it was who was stealing his key. But they all said, nobody, nobody. Horace Satchel Smith returned to the room, locked the door one more time, made sure that it was locked, it could not open, slid the bookcase back and then went off to work. At the end of his appointments and his art dealings, Instead of going straight home, he went to the locksmith's house. It was dark, for it was evening, and the locksmith's shop was shut. But that didn't stop Satchel Smith. He banged on the door and bellowed more. Locksmith, he said, locksmith, come on, open up. I need your assistance. A curtain at the back of the shop was pulled aside and the locksmith emerged and hurried to the door. Upon opening it, he shook his head and apologised and said, I'm sorry, sir, we're not open tonight. I don't care whether you're open or not. You're coming with me. I, I can't come with you. My wife is very ill. We lost our baby not long ago and she's still in mourning. I don't care about your problems, Satchel Smith boomed. You've installed a bad lock. It's broken. It's not working. You must come and fix it. So he near on dragged the poor locksmith out of the shop and took him back to his house and to the secret room. The locksmith examined the lock, taking time to make sure that it was working perfectly. He said, there is nothing wrong with this lock, sir. It is, as you asked, the strongest lock in all of Christendom. How come it keeps opening? He narrowed his eyes at the locksmith. Are you sure you only made one key? Yes, sir, there is only one key and you must not lose it, for if you do, you will never get inside. Is it possible that somebody else uses your key? No, of course not. I keep it with me at all sides. Then, said the locksmith, looking at the old timber-framed house, it is possible that other forces are responsible. Satchel Smith, lean forward. What do you mean, other forces? Perhaps this place is haunted, the locksmith suggested. Would you like me to change the lock? I can put a new one in. No, no, get your coat. Get out of here. I have no need for you. A ghost indeed, he said. And the locksmith hurried away, not given a penny for his troubles on his family's tragic day. 
Later that night, Satchel Smith locked the door. He slid the bookcase back, but instead of going to bed, he set himself the task to see what was really happening. Ghost indeed, he thought. He set himself up in a chair where he could watch the door all night long, and on every hour after the clock had chimed, he would get up and go to the door and test the handle. Yes, it was locked. He did this at twelve o'clock, and at one o'clock, and at two o'clock, and then at three o'clock he nearly fell asleep, but no, he stirred himself just in time, took another drink of water, and got up and tested the handle. Yes, it was locked. Four o'clock came, and five, and with six the dawn, and the dawn chorus, and as the sixth chime finished, he roused himself, shattered but still awake, and crossed to the door and twisted the handle once more. But the door opened. Confound it, he shouted, dashing into the room once again to check that his valuables were still there. They all were, nothing had stirred, but the door had become unlocked. This was really getting him down, for every night the same thing would happen. He would come down and find the door unlocked. No matter how much he spoke to the staff, nobody would admit to it. The suggestion of the ghost started to become gossip, and soon wherever he went people were asking him about his haunted house and how his doors were becoming unlocked. Businessmen would lower their newspapers and regard him with bemusement. More and more he found that this was unacceptable and uncomfortable, and eventually he had had enough. He had packed his bags, he had packed his valuables and all his belongings, and he left the house and he left Slindon for good. Some weeks later a new man took residence at the house in Slindon. He seemed to be a much kinder man and was liked by everyone in the community. He was sorting out his stuff and he came across the secret room, and he thought it would be an ideal place to put some of his valuables. But he noticed there was no key to the door, and he couldn't lock it, so he took a stroll down to the locksmith. The locksmith listened very carefully, and then nodded, and said, Yes, I know that lock, for I built it myself, but when I built it, I built it with a special clockwork mechanism, for you can lock the door at midnight, but by six o'clock it will unlock, in fact, on the very stroke. The man regarded him, quizzically. But why? Ah, said the locksmith. You see, the man who had the house before you ran my wife off the road when she was heavily pregnant, and we lost our child as a result. I had no power to do anything else, so this was the only way I could get back at him. And so there you have it, another peculiar tale from Old Sussex by Philip Mercer in his 1834 book. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget you can subscribe, follow and like, and why not leave a comment? And let me know if you would like more of these stories, for there are a few more. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.